just about every Christian church you've ever been in, almost, has a cross like that somewhere. They are on necklaces all over the place. They are on billboards all over the South. Crosses can be so ubiquitous to the point that we almost forget what they mean. Um, but here it is. It is a symbol. The cross is a symbol. We, we all know the reality of death. We don't have to discover that. We know the reality of death, but this tells us that there is a deeper truth to life. We all know the reality of despair, but this tells us that there is a deeper truth of redemption. We all know the reality of darkness, but this cross tells us that there is light that will always overcome. The cross comes from and speaks to the central story of Jesus and and of the church, to the good news of the whole world, a world that is so full of pain, but our world spins on the very power that challenges evil and lifts up hope. The cross speaks to a pattern, almost a current to life itself that just keeps pushing up from the reality of brokenness to the deeper truth of love. If you believe any of that, say amen. Amen. So what does every other church have? Almost every church has a cross, and almost every church has a pulpit, something like this. This one is 100 years old, a couple weeks ago. If you look at the little plaque, I have no idea who that lady is, but it says 1916 that this thing was built, so that's kind of neat. 100 years, this church has a pulpit. Most churches have a pulpit where some fool stands up here and tries to remind you about hope and love and faith. That message of hope and love and faith It is so easy to forget in a world that is just charged with harshness. And frankly, in too many pulpits, these sermons go on too long, or they're too judgmental, or they're just boring. And I hate that. I I think I hate it more. Anyone here ever been a waitress or a waiter? And you go, and you you can't help, but your whole life, every time you get waited on, you can't help but kind of think, oh, they did this a little bit wrong, they did that very well. That's me in a sermon. I listen to other preachers. drives me nuts. If you think you're critical of me, you should see me being critical of others. But listen, whether I'm good on one Sunday or boring on the next, there is nothing boring about the message that God is trying to bring out here. Nothing judgmental about what this church and churches are supposed to do. Nothing boring about what we're doing here as a people. The the message of freedom over judgment. Freedom for how we can be, how we should be in our hearts with other people. How we, how we can be the best individuals we can be, make the best world that it can be. It is, after all, good news. And if you believe that the church should lift up good news, say amen. 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 Okay, so churches have crosses. They have pulpits. Almost every church has some kind of music. And thank you, Andre, for filling in for Daniel this, uh, this morning very wonderfully. Most churches have music as a way to offer prayer, the kind of prayer that connects to those deep feelings in us that just slide under the words. Some churches use really big organs that I can't stand, and some of you love them. (laughs) Some churches just use all kinds of electric guitars and really loud drums that I put in earplugs. Some of you love them. I like our music here. I mean, Daniel brings some of us to spiritual ecstasy. Amen? Yes. Annie might be the best fiddle player any church has ever seen. She does, she's holding back a lot when she's playing fiddle. Our choir is small but mighty. I hear that we need a variety of musical experiences because we all have different life experiences, different understandings of God, different ways to connect to whatever that is at the base of humanity that runs under words. So you keep telling me what music you connect with God with, and together we'll sink further in because every church has some music, just about, just about. What else does every church have? <laughs> they, they have people. Things. They don't all have pews. Sometimes they have seats. That's... Uh, These pews have been moving around all summer. They're falling apart left and right. Most every other church has some kind of table. Some kind of table. Next to the cross, next to the pulpit, next to the music. You see it all through the Bible, tables. In the Hebrew scriptures, some characters in there, they build an altar, a very special table, on which to worship God. Or they make sacrifices at a very special one table in the temple. In the New Testament, Jesus is always getting in trouble from eating with those people. The biggest question, biggest accusation Jesus always gets is, why do you eat with those people, those sinners, those dirty folks, those poor folks, those gross and those alcoholic folks, those broken folks, why do you eat with them? 
If that's the worst complaint that this church receives, then I think we're doing okay. Even after Jesus, the early church often meets by sitting around dinner tables, not in special rooms like this, without, without pews. They sit around dinner tables, just like this table. Right to the end of Scripture, one of the only parts of Revelation that any of us can actually understand is when it says that the heavenly life is like a wedding feast. And you know the kind of wedding feast where they really go all out for it. Open bar, big spread, buffet, all the good stuff. That's the heavenly life described in Revelation, round table. So throughout Scripture, throughout the tradition of holy men and women that carry this here, throughout the life of this congregation, the table has been not a symbol, not a message, not a prayer, not a device. The table has been a real place for us to gather around. It is a destination to get away from the pain and stress of our regular lives and to come here for compassion, for acceptance, for renewal. We, we do more to remember these stories uh, when we're in this kind of place, but there we actually enact the grace that God brings to us. We do not simply remind ourselves of the truth, but we live into the truth of hope for here and hope for now. We do not merely feel the presence of God, but here we are sacred together. At the heart of our faithful tradition, the table means that we do not have to carry our difficulties and our worries in the perpetual chaos of our lives, alone and confused. The table means we have a space, welcomed, not judged, supported, not embattled, for the rest of our lives, not the busyness of our lives, to refresh our lives on a holy journey. And if anyone here wants rest and refreshment in your life, say, Amen. There are other tables that are important to our lives. Let us consider some other tables that play a big role. How many of you, your lives changed absolutely and dramatically when you or someone you loved was sitting on an examination table? How many of you sitting on that kind of table heard a diagnosis and you knew that life will never be the same? And it's not always right. It's not fair. What can we do? Who do we turn to? That table... Painful. How many of you, the bills keep piling up and piling up and you don't know what to do? So you make this little list. This is what I do. I make a little list of my income, a little list of maybe where I could find some income, a list of my expenses, maybe a list of where I can get rid of those expenses. And you sit down, the church does this too, and you sit there and you look at this financial table and you wonder, what am I going to do? It doesn't add up. No matter how hard we try, we can't get the financial table to fit together, and it is maddening and confusing and hopeless. And How can I trust that God is going to work out the finances? How can I rest if I have to work so hard to get the finances to work? Many of you, you have sat at a real table eating a simple dinner, with two chairs, but you're the only one there. There used to be someone in the other chair. Uh, you've been praying that someone will be in that other chair someday. You've been crying because somehow something went wrong and now you're the only one at the table. Some of us have dealt with water tables that were so low and literal droughts, spiritual droughts. Others have faced flood tables too high, literally the danger of washing away or just being overwhelmed by life. Some of us have looked at our life and what it has meant. What have my years meant? How did it matter? What comes next? And the only answer that you come to is, Tabula rasa. It's just been blank. My life has been blank. What is my purpose on this journey? I, I, I don't know. My point to all these tables, there are so many tables in our lives that lie at the root of such pain and difficulty and loneliness and fear. There are so many tables that bruise us and break us. But over six weeks now, we have building, been building one table step by step, designed and built and standing by the very power that created and holds us now. One table that is a place of comfort and grace and community and hope. There is one table that consistently holds us up to love and inspiration to love others. And Zacchaeus ate at a table with Jesus. This was, a, it was an invitation to eat together, but it's one of those weird invitations. Jesus almost seems intrusive. He says, I'm going to invite myself to your house. 
People ever do that to you? <laughs> what are you doing Friday? Let me come over. You want to cook for me? And this is kind of weird too. There is grace at that table, but it's a mixed up grace. Some Christians think this should work very linearly. Some Christians think God forgives because you repent. That's the direction of the because. Other Christians think you repent because God forgives. And they put the directions in those two ways. This is all mixed up. Here Zacchaeus just starts to repent because people are complaining. Or maybe because he's just in the presence of Jesus. Or maybe, who knows, he just wants to, he has that, he wants to pay back all his brokenness he's caused. But however it is, he starts to repent and Jesus doesn't wait to see if the forgiveness is real. Jesus doesn't wait to see if he actually pays back two or fourfold. Jesus just says, you know what, Zacchaeus, you are a jerk. And salvation is here today. And those two are not mutually exclusive. And that is a table unlike most of the tables in my life. So I don't understand how God works at a table like that. I don't understand why we are drawn to tables like that, why we are drawn to climb trees metaphorically for whatever it is that we can reach out to have an invitation. Maybe the point is is that I don't understand. I don't understand the mystery of what happens here. I don't understand how grace can happen when we come to this table. I don't understand how trusting that something's going to happen can make something happen. I mean, if I understood... If I understood how to fix my life, wouldn't I have done it already? If you knew that just working on your problems a little bit harder, then you'd fix it, then you'd work harder, and it would fix. If I could solve the problems of this town or this church or this world with just a checklist of things, I would get the pen out and start making checks. But it's never that straightforward. Often, we do not know how to get out of these cycles of frustration and despair. Often, I don't know how to accept love. I don't know how to get out of these ruts in my life of cynicism. I don't know where to find the strength to love those who hurt me. If you told me I could climb a tree, I'd climb a tree. That could give me an idea. If, if you told me I'd be, you know, just make a pledge to give some things away in my life and that would help, I'd do it. I'd be willing to even talk to someone about the really deep struggles and the risk involved in there. That would be hard, but I would do that. But what is even harder is to trust that something can happen out of my control. What's harder is to let an intrusive God get involved with your private life. What's harder is to pull up a chair, waiting for a word of guidance, a word of optimism, a word of endurance. When Jesus came to that table, and when Zacchaeus was able to humble himself and be open and trusting, Zacchaeus discovered a new freedom The freedom to let go of guilt. The freedom to start healing the pains he caused. The freedom to stop the cycle of heartless living and to start following the footsteps of a carpenter who built the world on love. And it would be amazing to have a table like that in our lives, in our kitchens. It would be amazing to be invited to that. It would be life-changing if we could just set an alarm and say, oh, it's the first Sunday of every month. Let's uh, go to that table and find that encouragement and that rest. That sit with God and with our neighbors and friends. Wouldn't it be something to have a place to go? Even if you don't believe the whole story of the cross. Even if the sermons don't hit home. Even if the music isn't your favorite. Even if the finances are a struggle. Even if you disagree with this or that. Even if you feel hurt by something that someone did. Even if your pain and health is so bad that you feel disassociated from the world. Wouldn't it be transformative to still, through all of that have a place where you can sit with the truth of existence itself. Wouldn't it be amazing if you could be as humble and open and trusting that you could feel the love of God that is flowing at you at all times so that you could sit with your struggles and fill your heart with a new sustenance of life. In a mysterious way, that is what God has built this place for. Let's sing two verses of our communion hymn and then share our time around the table.